I encourage you to open up there. Daniel 5. Uh, Daniel 5 is, is kind of fun. If you weren't with us last week, last week is Daniel 4, obviously. Uh, but Daniel 4 and 5 are, are really the same story with different endings. Uh, Daniel 5, uh, it, or Daniel 4 was about a king, King Nebuchadnezzar, who uh, went insane because of his pride and his ego. It led him to becoming like an ox or a cow, eating grass in the field. And, and Daniel 5 uh, is a sequel to Daniel 4. It's another king who lets his pride and his ego really overtake his life. So before we get into Daniel chapter 5, let me pray for us, that God would speak to us through his word, and that uh, Jesus would reveal himself to us today. Let's pray together. Jesus, as we open up your book, we pray that you would speak and you'd open our hearts to hear from you. Jesus, we, we desperately need to encounter you this morning. We need to be reminded of the truth of the gospel. We need to have our, 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 our lives laid bare before you so that you can critique and, and encourage a rebuke if needed, God. We, we need you. And so, Holy Spirit, would you come this morning and speak to us? Would you fill me and give me the words to say? Uh, and as we look at really this, this interesting story of Daniel chapter 5, will we find the hope, the hope of a God who, who does not let injustice slide, who does not let pride uh, continue on, but, but comes and uh, really confronts us and, and gives us opportunities to repent and, and come to you. So would you reveal yourself today? We pray this in your good name. Amen. All right, Daniel, Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. We're going to read the, the first verse. I might read a little bit extra. The first verse will be on the screen behind you. And uh, I might read a little bit more because I think it really helps set up the scene for what we're about to dive into. Uh, we have been reading the whole chapters in the previous weeks. We're not going to do that today. There's just a lot to get through. And I don't want to be here longer than we have to be. Like it could be a two-hour sermon. So we'll just keep it simple. So Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. Look at it with me. King Belshazzar made a great feast for thousands of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousands. Verse 2, Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines might drink from them. So that, that, that is the scene we're jumping into this morning. And it's interesting. We're, we're actually falling into a party. Uh, this party is taking place 70 years after Daniel's come to Babylon. At this point, Daniel no longer is working. He's a retired old man. He's over 80 years old, and he is living the good life. I don't know what he's doing in Babylon, but he is not working anymore. He is resting. And we actually know the exact date that this story is taking place. It's one of the rare stories in the Bible where we can put a pin on the calendar. This story is taking place on October 11th, 539 B.C. It's the exact date where it's taking place. We know this because other historical events are happening right here in this, in this moment of time that are, are reflected in the story. In verse 1, we're introduced to a king, King Belshazzar. He's a brand new king to us. Up to this point, it's always been King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Belshazzar is actually Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. Here he refers to Nebuchadnezzar as a father, and, and that's just a way of saying he's a part of the family. But it's Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, King Belshazzar. And King Belshazzar actually isn't the, the lone king. He's a co-king. He's ruling the kingdom with his father. Uh, his father, for some reason, isn't at, in Babylon at this moment. He's traveling. And so like any good son, when mom and dad are away, the kids are going to play. He throws a massive party. Uh, that's what he decides to do. And so he gets a thousand of his closest friends together to celebrate uh, something. They decide to, to bust out the wine. It's a, a party filled with uh, wine, sex, women, dancing, a, a good time. And what's interesting is when the party starts, we read in the first three verses that, that the king, Belshazzar, decides that to celebrate what is going on, to celebrate his kingdom, and his power and his might, he's going to get the vessels of gold and silver that his grandfather took from Jerusalem to toast his glory. He's going to bring them out and they're going to have a toast and a celebration of, of his kingdom, of his gods, of his power, his glory. And as, as King Belshazzar does that, as they bust out the, the goblets and the glasses and they start drinking out of them, what well, we did not read, but if we keep reading, what happens is that the finger of God appears and begins to write on the wall in the palace. 
Could, could you imagine that? Like how much wine do you have to drink to see a finger magically appear and start writing on the wall? This happens. And this, this writing begins to happen on the wall. And the second it happens, if we were to keep reading, we see that King Belshazzar begins to lose his mind. He begins to freak out. His knees begin to shake. He begins to tremble. And the words that are left inscribed on the wall are mini, mini, Tico Parson. The, the king reads these words, but he doesn't understand what they mean. So he begins to call in all his wise men, and the wise men can't interpret it for him. They have no idea what, what it says. And so could you imagine the commotion, the, like the music stops. No one's celebrating anymore. Everyone's freaking out. And the king's yelling probably, like, what do these words mean? Did you see the finger of God writing on the wall? What is going on here? The, the queen mother hears that the party has stopped, the, the, the beat's no longer going. She hears the king freaking out and comes in to see what's going on. Look at verse 11 with me. She sees that the wise men can't interpret the words and she has this advice for the king. There is a man in your kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy gods, within whom the spirit of the holy gods, in the days of your father, your grandfather, like the understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers, because an excellent spirit of knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams and explain riddles and solve problems were found in Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will show the interpretation. So the queen sees the issue here, the queen mother does. And it says, you need Daniel. So can you imagine old man Daniel getting pulled out of bed, all right? 80-something years old. Walking into the palace. And the king's saying, you need to help me here. And Daniel agrees to interpret what's been written on the wall. Look at verse 26 with me. If your Bible open. Daniel says, this is the interpretation of the matter. Many, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Talk about bad news for the party. Tico, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And Parshan, your kingdom is divided and will be give, given to the Medes and the Persians. So, so here's a king who has mocked God in this party. Like his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar has had this ego of saying, look at the kingdom that I am ruling over. Look how great it is. I am the king. And like his grandfather, God comes and confronts the king by writing on the wall. There's one more thing going on in the background of the story that we have to understand to help it make sense to us. What's going on in the historical part of this story is, is during this party... There's actually an army that has surrounded Babylon. The, Mer the, Persian, sorry, the, the Persian army has surrounded the, the walls of Babylon. And they are actively trying to conquer the kingdom. And so during this party, picture an army attacking the city. The army can't breach the walls of Babylon at this moment. The walls are, are huge. They're massive walls. And the army can't do it. But the, the army found a way to get into the city. There was a, a river that flew or flowed under the, the wall, the Euphrates River. And the army, the Persian army, decided to divert the water. And that led the, the water that went under the wall to, to sink. And so the Persian army, as this party is happening, all right, as Daniel is in the, in the castle, in the kingdom, speaking to the king, the Persian army is currently walking into Babylon, getting ready to kill King Belshazzar. The, the fate of the king, what, what God wrote on the wall in just a few hours is going to happen. There's this army coming in. So, so what is chapter 5 all about? Now, that's a brief overview of the chapter. What, what is the, the whole point of chapter 5? The, the whole point is hope. Which is kind of weird when you think about it. 
What is a finger of God writing on the wall to a, an egotistic king? What, is, what does that have to do with hope? Well, well, when we think about what's been going on to the, the people of Jerusalem or the, the exile, so the people of God, what they've experienced over the time is this, this prideful kingdom coming against them. They've, they've experienced wicked kings. They've experienced injustice. And here is King Belshazzar who is really the, the pinnacle of that injustice. Who in this moment is saying the God of Israel, Yahweh, he's worthless. He has no power. I'm the king. I'm celebrating myself. I'm like Yahweh. I'm better than him. And in that moment of pride and his ego, God comes against King Belshazzar and judges him. God comes against him and removes him from his throne. See, what, what is true in chapter 5 is true for us today. It was true for the exiles that Daniel's writing to. God will not let pride, injustice, wickedness go unpunished. Compass, God will not let pride, injustice, and wickedness go unpunished. God is at work and God will redeem. That, that was the hope for the exiles, and that's the hope for us today. So, so in our time together this morning, I just want to look at, at, at three things that Daniel 5 reveals to us. Three, three key elements of the story for us, all right? Let's look at these three things. Number one, the first thing that Daniel 5 reveals to us is that we tend to practice escapism. We tend to practice escapism. The, the question that Daniel 5 raises is why is this king having a party? If this king knows that the armies, the, the Persian army is at the gates trying to overthrow his kingdom, if he knows that there's a war being raged, why is he getting drunk? Why is he having a party? And it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us. And, and for a, a number of, of centuries, historians have tried to figure out the same thing. Like why is the most powerful kingdom in the world, the most powerful king at that point, Instead of fighting, partying. And there's been different, different reasons why, why scholars believe he's having a party. One is they believe there's a festival taking place for the, the Babylonian gods. So this was, their, this was a, a, a yearly festival. And so they were, they were partying to celebrate that. Other scholars believe that the, the king knew what was about to happen. They, they, the king knew that this was the end of the road for him. That it was only a matter of time before his kingdom fell. And instead of facing that hard reality, he decided to drink, have sex, and dance the night away. That's what he wanted to do. So he invited all his friends together to, to really escape from the reality of the moment. Instead of facing his impending collapse face to face, he decided just to medicate himself through it. It's funny how we as humans, when, when we face extreme challenges, when we face difficult realities, how, how we respond to them. We're, we're not that different than Belshazzar. If you remember two years ago when we had two weeks to fly on the curve, you remember that? Uh, when that was going on and COVID was entering our, our world, what was our reaction to the unknown reality of COVID? Do you remember this? We went to Costco and bought every roll of toilet paper we could find. Like people responded in the most interesting way. I, I don't know if that's a natural response to a pandemic. I don't know what they did back in like 1918 when the Spanish flu was coming. But like who knew that two-ply was so valuable to us? We respond in interesting ways. I remember as a kid, Y2K. Any, anybody remember Y2K? The world was going to end December 31st when Y2K came. I remember people building bunkers in their house in, in the States. Of course, buying guns. Buying can, canned foods, supplying their house. I don't know about toilet paper, but they supplied their house because they thought the world was going to end. We respond in interesting ways. We, we try to cope with the reality of the moment in really interesting ways. And that's, that's what we see here in Daniel chapter 5. King Belshazzar, in the face of reality, he tries to escape it. He tries not to deal with it. And we do the same thing today in our lives, do we not? When we're, we come face to face with the reality of our lives compass, a lot of times it's, it's too much to bear and so we try to escape it. 
Thinking about the big questions of life, about purpose and meaning. We talked about this a bit last week. The, the feeling of trying to justify our experience, our existence on life, on the earth, sorry. We have these big, deep questions of why am I here? What was the point of everything? And, and those questions, if you sit with them for too long, become incredibly scary to us. And so instead of wrestling with them, instead of looking at them head on, what do we do? We escape. We, we amuse ourselves to death, right? Is that not the, the whole reality of, of our world right now? We, we escape through technology, through social media. We, we just continue to, to go through our timelines, to look at people's lives. We escape through Netflix. We sit on the couch night in and night out instead of dealing with the hard issues of, of our world and, and just watch one show after another. We escape through sex, through consumerism, through busyness. When I say we amuse ourselves to death, I don't mean we just do a lot of stuff until we're burnt out and dead. What I mean is we try to keep ourselves busy until we die. Because that's a lot easier than asking some of these hard questions of life. Maybe that's you here this morning. Maybe there's deep, transcendent questions that you've avoided asking and wrestling with. Because the, the reality of it scares you. You know, some, some philosophers say we're two to three questions away from having our worldview fall apart. And maybe that's very real to you. And so instead of facing that head on, you just amuse yourself to death, you escape. Or, or maybe you're here this morning and you escape because of pain in your life. Maybe as you, you look at your life, there's choices you've made or, or experiences you've been through that left deep scars across your soul. And instead of facing those realities, facing that pain, coming face to face with those choices, it's easier for you to, to escape from them. And so you, you keep yourself busy. Maybe you medicate, but you do whatever you can to avoid experiencing and coming face to face with the pain in your life, with the sin in your life, with the consequence of choices in your life. Listen, if, if that's you here this morning, there's good news from the gospel for you. The gospel actually addresses you head on with that reality. The good news of the gospel is that your sin does not define you. The good news is that Jesus took your sins upon him. You don't have to bear them anymore. You have to hold on to them. They do not have to define you. As the, the great hymn, It Is Well With My Soul says, My sin, O oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. That, that's the good news of the gospel for us this morning, Compass. The, the path to healing is not through escapism. It's not through running from your pain or your sin or your hurt. It's actually bringing it to the cross of Jesus and laying it at his feet. Your sin might be deep and messy and ugly, but God's grace is deeper than you could imagine. Your shame tells you there's no going back, that the door is closed. But God says to you a, a deep invitation this morning. And the invitation is this. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Escapism only leads to deeper pain and hurt compass. Only God's grace can bring the deep healing that you and I need. Escapism isn't new to us. King Belshazzar was doing it on October 11th in 539 B.C. But the second thing that stands out from our, our text this morning is how his wise men fell, fell him. And this is a true reality for us today. Our, our wise men fell us. The, the repeating story in the book of Daniel is that the wise men of Babylon can't answer the king's questions. We see this in chapter 2. We see this again in chapter 3, in chapter 4, 
in chapter 5 today and we'll see it again in chapter 6. Whenever, whenever the wise men are brought into the story, they're always left saying, we don't know. Look, look at verse, verses 7 and 9 with me of chapter 5. The, the king sees the writing on the wall and he cries out. Look at what he says in verse 7. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers, and the king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads the writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. And then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known, the king, the, make known to the king the interpretation. But that's the repeating story, if you've been with us. The wise men come in, they can't answer the questions of the king. And then comes Daniel. And Daniel comes on the scene. And he doesn't come all pumped up that he has the answers. He comes and he says the same thing over and over again. He says, there is a God in heaven. O king, I don't have the answers for you, but there's a God in heaven who reveals wisdom to men. Over and over, Daniel says that. And over and over, we see that the wise men of Babylon fail the king. Compass, the, the question that, that this makes us ask is, who are the wise men that we go to today? Who are the wise men of Babylon here? Who are the, the men and women in our lives that we look to for wisdom over and over again? As I thought about that question in my life, you know, there's, there's people that kind of come up on my, my news feeds on social media or I see on YouTube, people like Joe Rogan or Jordan Peterson. They're, they're, they're people that we look to as, as wise men, and we can debate whether they're wise or not, but, but they're people that we look to for information. There's politicians or educators. There's the podcasts that we go to over and over again. There's the musicians and famous people, celebrities, that we look to for wisdom in our lives. And all these wise men are, as, are trying to answer the four basic questions of humanity. Who is God? What's wrong with this place? How can it be fixed? And what hope can I find for the future? Those are the four questions of humanity. The, those are four worldview questions that all the wise men in our world are trying to answer. And just like in Babylon, those wise men, they can lead us astray. They can lead us not closer to God, not closer to wisdom, but further from it. The question for us this morning is, where in our lives do we desperately need God's wisdom? Where in our lives are, are we searching for wisdom, but we're maybe looking to the wise men of Babylon instead of the God of the heavens? Where in your life, Compass, do you need to hear a word from God? The good news is that God has spoken. God has spoken through his word. He's spoken through Jesus to us. We have the wisdom of God available to us. The, the question is, do we have ears to hear? Do we have ears to hear? In chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar calls Daniel in and Daniel tells him the interpretation to his dream. And for 12 months, God graciously gives time for Nebuchadnezzar to repent and come back. And eventually he, he doesn't hear and he, he becomes like an ox for, for seven periods of time until he repents. In chapter 5, Daniel comes and, and gives the interpretation from God about the finger on the wall. And King Belshazzar does not repent. He doesn't have ears to hear from the wise men, from the God of heaven. Compass, our, our wise men constantly fail us. They practice spiritual malpractice. They misdiagnose what's wrong with our world. They misdiagnose how it can be fixed. They misdiagnose where we can find hope from. What, what wise men are you listening to? The, the third thing that stands out from our, our text this morning, the third point that is made is that the, the writing on the wall is for all of us. The writing on the wall is for all of us. What, what does the finger of God write on the wall? It writes, mini, mini, tico, parson. And there's, there's these charges made against the king. As Daniel interprets what 
these words mean. There's, there's charges given to the king. Look at verse 22 with me. Chapter 5, verse 22. This is Daniel's charge to the king. This is what God is holding against the king. It says this, And you, son, you his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. But you have lifted yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver, gold and bronze, iron, wood and stone, which, you, which do not he, see or hear or know. But the God whose hand is your breath, whose hand is your breath and whose are your, all your ways you have not honored. In the early part of verse 22, do you notice he says, you have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. What, what is he referring to? What is all this that, that Belshazzar knew? He's pointing back to his grandfather, the king, King Nebuchadnezzar. When I was a kid, I, I, have a gra- I had a grandfather who was missing his, his pointer finger. He cut it off building a barn. And so my grandpa always pointed at things with his middle finger. And as a little kid, I loved my grandpa. I wanted to be like my grandpa. And so I, I'd hang out with grandpa for a while. And when I leave the farm, I'd point everything with a metal finger, except I'd just flip everyone off. And, and my mom would always be like, you can't do that. And I'd be like, well, grandpa did it. And, and, and it was well known in our family, the story of grandpa cutting his finger off. My mom always told it. My aunts told it. We, we saw the stub. We saw grandpa point. We knew what happened to grandpa in our family. But the story of what happened to, to Belshazzar's grandpa, King Nebuchadnezzar, how he went insane, how his ego got in the way of of him honoring God, that story would have been well known to Belshazzar. That would have been some distant memory. It would have been something that, that Belshazzar didn't know. He would have known the story. He would have known the danger of ego and pride, of of challenging Yahweh. And although Belshazzar knew that story, he knew what happened to his grandfather. What, what did he do in chapter 5? The exact same thing. And so Daniel reveals the charge of God against them. There's two charges. First, the main charge against them is that, that Belshazzar has not worshipped God. What, what did Belshazzar, Belshazzar worship? The gods of gold, silver, iron, bronze, woods, But not, not Yahweh. Not the true God of heaven. Belshazzar had not realized and confessed that all the glory that he experienced as king, all the power, all the splendor of his kingdom, it all came from God and God alone. Instead of living to please God, he lived to please himself. Compass, if God was to write on the wall of St. Matthew's this morning, if the finger of God was to appear and write, it would be incredibly fearful for us. It would be incredibly disappointing because we lose our damage deposit for the building. But, but what would God charge us with? Would this first charge of living to please ourselves instead of God, would that be a charge against you and me? In our lives, are we living to please Yahweh, the God of heaven, or ourselves? The, the second charge against the king from God was that he used what was set apart from God it was set apart for God, sorry, and his purposes for himself. He took these golden vessels of, of gold and silver from the, the temple in Jerusalem that were used. They were consecrated. That means they were set apart for one purpose only. And that purpose was the worship of God. And he used those to celebrate himself and his false gods. Picture it like this. Imagine that like last night you were driving down the street here. And as you drove past St. Matthew's all of a sudden all you heard was bass. Right? Like our two subs were just going hard. And you looked at the stained glass windows and they were, they were lighting up, but it was like a light show in here. And you're like, there's a party happening at St. Matthew's. Why wasn't I invited? Right? Like you're like, what is going on? And so you pull over, you got to investigate. And you, you walk through the doors in the back. And as you walk in, you're constantly seeing like a purple haze. Right? And it smells like skunks in here. And you're like, what is happening in St. Matthew's? And as you come in, you see people tearing the pages out of the Bible and rolling joints with them. And then as you, you look around, you see people taking the communion cups at the back and like doing shots. And you're like, what is happening here? That, that's essentially what Belshazzar was doing. He was taking 
things, that sole purpose was the worship of God, the honor of God, and he was defiling them. If people were here using this church as a rave, using the Holy Scriptures as rolling papers, using communion wine as a way to get intoxicated, they would be taking things that were designated, consecrated for God's holy worship to celebrate themselves, to party. The king was doing that. And in doing that, the king was walking in sin. The king was using what was meant for God in a way that does not honor God. And you and I, Compass, we do the same thing, do we not? Two, two examples of how we do that in our lives. Number one, we do that with our, our very lives. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2 talks about how God redeemed us by his grace alone. It's the famous verses 1 to 10 talk about God's amazing grace and rescuing and redeeming us and how it transforms us. But then in verse 2, we, we see that God saved us, not because of what we did, but he saved us to good works. Compass, if you have been made new in Jesus, you have been consecrated, you have been set apart for the good works that God has prepared for you. You've been set apart for his purpose. First Peter talks about us being holy priests. And there, there's a different connotations with that that we can unpack. But what it means for you and I is that we've been consecrated for God's purpose. The priests in the Old Testament were set apart for the purposes of Yahweh, to worship him, to lead his people in worship. They had one job, one purpose. You and I, Compass, we have one purpose as followers of Jesus. We've been set apart, we've been consecrated to live for him. To honor God with our lives. But, but so often we don't live that way, do we? I know I don't. So often we, we look at our lives as our lives being set apart for our own purposes. We look at God as, as kind of rocket fuel for our lives to help us to get to a point where we can orbit around our desires. Have you guys ever seen a space shuttle before? I got a picture of an old one up here. That's the old space shuttle. It's not as cool as the new ones. But, but the old ones are actually, the space shuttle themselves are actually quite small. That, that big orange tank, that's a fuel tank. And there's two huge rockets on the side. And those rockets are designed to get the space shuttle up into orbit. So it can, it can get up into the atmosphere. So often we treat God as the orange fuel container with the two rockets. We're the space shuttle, and God's job is to, to make our wildest dreams come true, to help us have a fulfilled life. And so we take this, this consecrated life that God has called us to, and instead of living for his honor and his purpose, we, we live for our purpose and our honor. Instead of living for his glory and his, his desires, we live for our glory and for our desires. Compass, how, how are you doing that in your life right now? Are, are you looking at your life as a set apart for God and for his honor and his glory? Or are you looking at your life set apart for yourself, for what you want to do, for your passions? I think the second way we, we do this in our lives, Compass, is with our wealth. There's an interesting passage in the book of Malachi that asks two real questions. Two real questions. The first question is, will, God, will man rob God? And the second question is, how we rob God? Well, we've robbed God by not giving to him. In the text of Malachi, it says about not giving a tithe to him. The people of God had not given back their, their 10%. And God considers this a stealing from himself. And just like Belshazzar did with the temple, when we do not use the wealth that God has entrusted to us in honor of him, and when we do not give it back to him as an act of worship, we are misusing the resources God has given us. We've taken a, a consecrated thing and defiled it. We've not used it for his honor or his purpose. We find ourselves doing the same thing as Belshazzar. Is that us here this morning, Compass? We look at what God has given us. Are we guilty of stealing from him. Well, let's bring chapter 5 home this morning. See, the, the reality for you and me, Compass, is that we're not like Daniel. <laughs> we're not the 80-year-old guy who steps in to, to give the hard truth to the king. We are the king. We are Belshazzar. We have all raised our glasses in rebellion to God. 
we've all taken consecrated things and said we are the kings and queens of our universe. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 1, verse 23. He says, We did not honor him that is God as God or given thanks to him. We became fools, exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men. We have all, Compass, exchanged God, his love, his mercy, his grace for other things. And because you and I have all done that, on God's scale, we've been found wanting. What was Daniel's judgment? What was God's judgment about Shazer? God had weighed him. He was found wanting. He was found in deficit. But do you notice Belshazzar's response to this awful writing on the wall? Just think about this for a moment. You know your kingdom's being attacked. You see the finger of God right on the wall. Your party stops. You all of a sudden sober right up. And Daniel comes in and says, hey, your days are numbered. Your kingdom's coming to end. What, what would be your response, Compass? I, I hope for my life, my response would be like, oh, crap. God, I'm sorry. <laughs> Daniel, what, what do I need to do? Do I need to repent? What do I got to do, buddy? You got to tell me. But what, what's the king's response? Look at verse 29 with me. <clears throat> Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple, a chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Think about that for a second. The party stops, and Belshazzar, instead of humbling himself before God, just continues on like he's in control. It doesn't phase him. He continues on acting like the king. He tells Daniel, Daniel, congratulations. You're now the third most powerful person in my kingdom. That's like getting promoted to being manager at Blockbuster right now. Right? Like, it's pointless. His kingdom ended in just a few hours. Compass, my, my prayer for you this morning and for myself, my desperate hope and plea to you this morning is if God is writing on the wall of your life, if he's revealing areas in your life where you're trying to escape from him, areas where you're listening to the, the wisdom of Babylon instead of the wisdom of God, areas where you are living out a life that is not consecrated to him, but consecrated to something else, that as God writes on the wall of your life, that you would not follow the pattern of Belshazzar. That you would not walk in ignorance and just continue on like you are the king or queen of your kingdom but that you would humble yourself this morning, Compass. That you would repent. That you would come before God and say, you're right. I have not honored you. I have not lived for you. I, I need your grace. Compass, God has come to us this morning and he has written on the walls of our lives. You know, the finger of God appears multiple times in the Bible. It appears in Exodus as God through Moses performs miracles in front of uh, Pharaoh's wise men. It appears in Exodus as God writes the, the Ten Commandments on, on stone. And it appears again in the New Testament in Luke chapter 11, I believe it's verse 32, as Jesus does a miracle, they say truly this is the finger of God at work. The finger of God has appeared to us and it's come and revealed areas in our lives where we've been found in wanting. It reveals areas in our lives where we do not measure up before God. The question is, how will you respond? Now we can respond by trying to tip the scales in our favor. Maybe your natural response is to try to put your finger on the scale, you know, and say, I, I can do this. I can, I can earn God's love and respect. I can earn my way back before God. I'm just going to, you know, clean my life up and try to improve on what I've been doing. But Compass, listen to me. No matter what you do, you can never tip the scales in your favor before God. There's only one who can do that, and that's Jesus. Jesus came to take your sins, the, the sins that found you wanting before God. He came and he took those sins upon his shoulders. 
And in doing so, the scales have tipped in your favor before God. Before God, you will never be found wanting, no matter what you face in your life, when you have Jesus. Do you believe that, Compass? Do you believe that? The, till, the, the scales have been tipped in your favor because of Jesus. It's impossible for them to ever go back the other way. The, the, other, the other thing we have to see in this chapter as we close this morning is the hope. Remember, this chapter is all about hope. And it, it's kind of a weird way of getting at it. <laughs> the king gets killed. A new king comes to power. Why, why is this hopeful? Well, we need to remember this. This book was written to exiles, people who have experienced incredible pain and injustice, people whose God was mocked. As Nebuchadnezzar came into the temple and took those vessels, as King Belshazzar took those vessels and drank wine out of them, as he toasted to his gods, their God was mocked openly. And here, as the king and his kingdom fall, God reminds his people that he has not forgotten about them. That Yahweh is still on the throne. He's still in control. And there's hope. Compass, do you, do you ever feel hopeless? As you look at the world, as you look at your life, you look at what's going on, what you desire, do you ever feel hopeless? Do you ever feel like the w- wicked run free? that they escape punishment. This, this chapter is a reminder to us as we close that God's on the throne, that he has the final word, that what has been broken in your life, what has been broken in our world, he will restore, he will make whole. And this compass, this allows us to live faithfully in the darkness and the brokenness of Babylon. That is the good news to us this morning. Let's pray together. Jesus, we we thank you that you are sitting on the throne. That you are on the right hand, you're on the right hand of God. That you're in control. And I, I know, God, so often I look at our world and I look at the events, I look at my life and I look at the pain and the suffering and the ups and downs, and I just so often I doubt that. But Jesus, would you would you speak to us this morning and just remind us that, that you are in control? that you are good. God, I, I pray this morning that if there's those of us where, where you've written on the, the walls of our lives, God, would you give us ears to hear and eyes to see? God, as you confront us this morning in, in, in certain ways, areas in our lives where we're trying to escape from, from what you're doing, Areas in our lives where we're not listening to, to your wisdom. Areas in our lives where we're not living for you, God. Would, as you confront us with that, would we have humble hearts here this morning, knowing that you're a God who loves and pursues us. You don't come after us to beat us down or to, to, to destroy us, but you come to rescue and love us. Would you remind us of that truth this morning? Would we have the humility to turn to you? We pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks, Luke, for that word. We're going to transition, and and we've encountered God in His Word, and He's taught us, and now we're going to respond in worship. Um, At the Compass, we do that in a few ways. We're we're going to sing, worship team's going to come up, uh, and we'll have three songs to to worship. Um, We're also going to take communion together, and and if you're a believer in Christ and you've confessed Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life, um, we'd invite you to join us for communion if you don't know him like that, we'd ask that you, you hold back. We're super thrilled you're here. Um, we talk about communion as though it's family supper, right? And this is a, a chance where we have to remember whose table we sit at uh, and the God that pursued us and sent his son to die and uh, conquer death and sin on our behalf so that we can live forever. Um, and so, you know, if you are checking Jesus out, if you're not sure where you're at in faith, um, you know, feel free to talk to me, talk to Luke, talk to someone else after church. We'd love to talk to you more about that. Uh, we just ask that you hold back from communion. Uh, and, and as Luke was talking about the idea of, of escape and our temptation to escape, I, I was thinking about just God's good design and making communion a regular part of our rhythm, right? The Bible says when we meet, you should do communion. 
and, and there's a few things that we need to do. One, we need to be in right standing with God to take communion. So this is an opportunity, if you're feeling that tug to escape, draw in. Communion calls us to draw into God and to confess those areas where we're tempted to escape, where we want to pull away. Communion doesn't let us do that. Communion forces us in. The other thing it does is it also creates a unity as a church, right? It's not just family supper with who's at the head of the table, God. It's family supper with who we're sitting at the table with, each other. So as you take communion, I'd invite you, look around. Remember who's in your family. And the other aspect of communion is being in right standing with each other as the, as the body and as the family of God. Um, if there are things you need to make right with each other, do that before you take communion. Pray, go chat with someone if you need to. Uh, and, and the other aspect of unity and just family time together is, you know, for those of you who've been with us at Laval or other places we've rented, you know, there's our rental ends in 10 minutes after the service, and we have a basketball team waiting, and there's that temptation to like, oh, we got to run out of here. We don't have that in St. Matthew's, which is such a blessing. We have lots of time. So I'd encourage you as we come out of our responsive worship, as we close our service, spend time hanging out with each other, hang out at the back, chat, and just enjoy the, the goodness that is community in God. And that's another way that we fight that temptation to escape with the good gift of the family that God's given us. So if you don't have a communion cup and you want to partake, throw your hand up. Becky will make sure you get a cup. Um, and then I'll pray and the worship team will come up and we will respond in worship together. Um, if you call the Compass West home, um, you can also give with your tithes and offerings. You can scan that code or go online. Um, if you don't go here, this isn't for you. We're just glad that you're here. So let me pray and we'll, uh, we'll worship together. God, thank you that you're a God who loves us enough to call us out. You're a God who loves us enough to write on the walls of our hearts. And you do that when we encounter you in your word. Um, thank you for just the knocks on the door and your grace that you love us enough to call us out. You love us enough to pursue us. You love us enough to save us, God. God, I pray that as we, as we worship, that we'd remember that we find our joy when we submit and we worship you, God. Our, our temptation is so often to escape um, because you seem scary, your rules seem restrictive, but, but it's the opposite, God. Our temptation is to escape to death, um, but you call us to escape death in salvation and, and just trust in knowing you, God. And then that's also where we find our greatest joy and our fulfillment. So I pray today as we worship, Holy Spirit, would you just make the joy of knowing you felt deeply in our hearts, um, and that would just change how we live this next week, um, this next month, even the rest of today, God. So blessing on the rest of our time together.